Bonjour à tous euh, et merci d'être de présent donc, euh, et toujours aussi nombreux dans ce cycle de conférences euh, du, euh, du Conseil central de l'économie, donc sur cette, sur ce débat public que nous voulons ouvrir évidemment sur euh, la gouvernance budgétaire, mais de manière évidemment euh, globale, c'est sur l'évolution évidemment des finances publiques dans un climat euh, économique qui est toujours euh, compliqué et euh, de voir comment on peut coordonner l'ensemble des politiques économiques, monétaires et euh, budgétaires. Alors aujourd'hui, évidemment, j'ai un plaisir encore plus particulier que d'habitude, évidemment, d'accueillir mon ancien professeur de théorie monétaire, parce que c'est lui qui m'a d'abord enseigné euh, la théorie monétaire, donc c'est Peter Pratt, euh, donc professeur évidemment euh, à l'ULV, euh, docteur euh, en économie, évidemment qui a un parcours extrêmement riche, puisque évidemment, euh, il, a, euh, il est passé par le Fonds monétaire euh, international, euh, euh, une, banque, euh, une banque privée, avant de passer par un cabinet ministériel et donc aussi avoir cette expérience de conseiller, avant évidemment de passer à la Banque nationale de Belgique, de gérer une partie de la crise euh, financière de 2008-2009 et euh, de terminer évidemment au directoire de la Banque centrale européenne et d'être le chief economist euh, de la Banque centrale européenne. C'est avec ces multiples casquettes aujourd'hui, je pense que nous, euh, nous l'accueillons. Euh, J'espère qu'il n'a pas disparu, parce que je ne le vois plus. Ah, voilà. euh, C'est avec ces multiples casquettes que nous l'accueillons pour avoir son avis, justement, dans notre débat sur euh, la gouvernance budgétaire euh, européenne. Alors, je rappelle à tout le monde, évidemment, que vous pouvez participer euh, au débat en nous envoyant dans le chat euh, toutes les questions que vous auriez envie de poser. On a, euh, à la demande de, de Peter Pratt, euh, on va plutôt avoir une conversation, donc je vais lancer les premières questions, euh, mais vous pourrez évidemment euh, parfaitement influencer le débat euh, avec des questions dans le chat que nous pourrons évidemment euh, euh, poser euh, à notre conférencier du jour. Euh, donc la première question, euh, Peter, évidemment, par rapport à la situation évidemment, que vous, nous vivons aujourd'hui, tout le monde s'inquiète évidemment de l'évolution des dépenses publiques, parce que certes nous avions déjà connu des chocs en termes de finances publiques, mais celui évidemment provoqué par la crise Covid est exemplaire euh, à, plusieurs, à plusieurs égards et donc évidemment inquiète puisqu'on ne sait pas évidemment très bien un, quand ça va s'arrêter et surtout comment après prendre des mesures. Alors est-ce qu'il faut parler d'austérité, d'assainissement, de retour à un équilibre euh, Toutes les questions évidemment sont posées. Donc voilà ma, ma première question, quel est ton point de vue par rapport à, à cette évolution évidemment euh, des dépenses publiques oui. Euh, pardon, euh, Benoît, si je oui. peux, il euh, y avait quelques personnes qui avaient demandé si on pouvait faire en anglais. Euh, ah. Donc, si Peter uh, could, could speak in English, perhaps it's, it's better. Okay. We have also English speaking persons in uh, uh, that will be more easy. So, and uh, all the people in, in can um, put questions in the chat. Eh? Uh, they can not speak. The microphones are off. It's a webinar. So, uh, only. Peter and the persons of uh, the Secretariate can speak, others are uh, not able to speak. They can only give and chat the questions. Okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, Benoît, c'est okay? Oui, oui, c'est okay, mais chacun peut poser les questions dans la langue qu'il veut. Donc, à, à quoi on demande de répondre en anglais pour que tout le monde comprenne? Je vais parler en anglais. Okay. Oui. <laughs> uh, Goedemorgen, bonjour, good morning. Um, Uh, thank you for the invitation, and uh, I saw some of the very good friends, uh, in particular Jan Smets, because he's, he's really the specialist uh, in, in public finances, and uh, so uh, I will speak under his control. Uh, I think, Benoit, what is very important to realize, I mean, everybody knows it, but I will say it, if you look at the 13, the, the last decade, a little bit more than the last decade, Uh, public debt increased basically in many countries by something like 40 percentage points of GDP. So that's a huge increase in a decade, a little bit more than a decade. And this is nothing to do with the aging because we knew that there were some pressures because of social security, healthcare related to aging, but this is due to uh, shocks which were unexpected. So I think it's very important to realize this. Uh, it's 40 percent of GDP percentage points in advanced economies, and uh, who knows what could happen in the future. So uh, when we talk about uh, debt, debt, public debt in particular, 
the notion that uh, there may be some shocks in the future uh, that may uh, mobilize huge amounts of resources, I think we have to keep that in mind. The second point, when you look at the situation, you see some countries uh, uh, with relatively similar situations uh, performing very differently. If you look, for example, uh, at France or Germany, uh, in 2008 or seven or eight, before the global financial crisis, the debt GDP ratio uh, in France and Germany were similar. We talk about about 60% of GDP. Now Germany uh, is uh, certainly 30 percentage points debt GDP ratio below below what we see in France. There are many reasons for that. I don't want to argue on this, but also many differences uh, in the debt dynamic. I can take another country like Italy. Uh, which is now uh, heading towards something like 160, 165 percent, perhaps, of GDP of debt. So that's my first point, but one. The second point uh, is that, yes, uh, debt GDP ratios have increased, but actually, paradoxically, uh, the service of the debt, the service of public debt, has in many countries fallen uh, in place of increasing. So in spite of the huge increase of debt, uh, debt services gone down. If you take Belgium, for example, the debt service ratio is 1.4, uh, 1.3, 1.4, which is historically low. Uh, so, and, 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 and from there you have a lot of stories, uh, a narrative that as long as uh, the interest rate is below uh, the potential growth, uh, or the, you know, the, 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 the sustained you know, uh, interest rate is below uh, potential growth, there is no limit actually to the increase of uh, government deficits, because you know the additional debt uh, will be uh, paid, you know, at an interest rate which is lower uh, than the rate of growth of the economy, so that uh, you denominate you, the, the denominator, uh, the debt GDP ratio uh, actually fall even, depending you know how far you go into your primary deficit. So uh, this notion that, uh, especially for advanced economy, the interest rate is lower than potential growth leads to a number of uh, a sort of narrative uh, that you know you should really use that window of opportunity. I think uh, yes, there is an argument to that, and we have to discuss. That. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, you know, and this privilege of age, uh, everything can happen. So I would always say, you know, yes, that's yeah, there are good arguments to say to defend that, uh, but there is also a good argument to say, you know. Who knows what could happen in the future? That's my first point. The second point, when we talk about the interest rates below potential growth rate, uh, uh, it depends, you know, of your safe haven status. Uh, if you are really considered by markets in general as a risk, you know, as a safe haven, as a country with very good uh, fundamentals, or if you are a big power like the United States, but who knows in the U.S. what could happen in the next decade? But if you are considered as one of these, you know, safe haven countries, uh, yes, maybe the argument is stronger. But if you are uh, in, in another situation uh, with a different history, with a different, you know, uh, a different uh, level of that, even uh, you don't know how the spreads uh, could evolve. So uh, yes, the argument that the free rate may be lower than potential growth. Yes, there is some case to defend that. But I say, be careful. Who knows? But the second also, you have to take into account the risk premium, uh, which for some countries can jump, as we have seen for Italy, Greece, and other countries, but also for Belgium in some episodes. And that, that's really for the future, something we have to discuss very carefully. Uh, now, if you look at interest rates, just to finish that second point on interest rates, the first point on interest rate has to do with the normal, what is the normal interest rate, what the economy is called the natural rate. The natural rate, uh, yes, has fallen uh, over several decades now, and you know the arguments is due to demographic uh, and, and, and some other factors, but what I, I, I say, that's, that's fine. I mean, that's, that's something which is well documented. It may revert in the future, you know, Charles Goodhart and others defend the point that the demographic trend at some point will change. The people. A low interest rate uh, and low inflation are due to the competition of China, etc., etc. 
I just want to bring the point that, you know, the long-term real rate, the real interest rate, uh, excluding inflation, the real interest rate is a function of the potential growth of the economy. So the lower the potential growth, the lower, you know, the normal interest rate. Uh, that because the interest rate can represent basically the return on, on capital, uh, plus the risk premium, of course. But uh, if you take the, the core, you know, of the interest rate, uh, it's a potential growth of the economy. And, uh, and uh, so the good news, you could say, is that the interest rates, the normal rate has fallen. But the bad news is that the long term growth has also fallen. To a lesser extent, in most cases, that's true. But still, there is a relation between. So suppose with the COVID crisis that the potential growth is going to go down further. Uh, you could say that's bad news. And then you say the interest rate will remain low for a very long time. You could say it's good news. But it's not only good news when rates are very low, because it also reflects the weakness of potential growth. That's my point. I should have summarized it that way. Uh, the second is what I mentioned before, the safe haven. Uh, uh, that when things go bad, uh, some countries like the United States, the reserve currency country, and, and I hope in the future the euro, uh, it's not yet the case, but Germany it's the case, you know, all this, this money, you know, uh, flows to the safe haven countries and that pushes their interest rate down and that facilitates the adjustment to a shock if it's a global shock, because their interest rates can tend to go down uh, because because of all this money coming from everywhere in the world to find to, to be part, you know, in a, in, in a safe environment. And that helps. That's one of the reasons why many Europeans want to develop the international role of the euro. Uh, it involves responsibilities, of course, uh, to manage well your economy, of course, when you're an international currency. But when there are big negative shocks, you know, it can help to have, a, to have a, an international currency. But uh, you have to manage that, of course, politically also. The third argument, I think, uh, is the monetary policy. And uh, a lot of people mention monetary policy as the key uh, explanation of the low rates. Uh, as I said, there are fundamental factors. Uh, it's an important factor, of course, uh, when the ECB puts the interest rates at minus 0.5%. It has, of course, an implication on the whole curve, on the whole interest rate curve. Uh, but what I, I want to say here, uh, is that what is really new in the monetary policy here is uh, that monetary policy has tended to compress risk premium in general, uh, risk premium, and uh, the question for the future, which I will discuss a bit later, uh, is how far can the central bank compress risk premium, uh, 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 just the spreads, actually. And that's, I leave for a little bit later, because that's, a fundamental discussion. You remember that in the uh, sovereign debt crisis that we had, the sovereign debt crisis that we had, you know, between 2010 and 2012, uh, the spreads, you know, the premium that some countries were paying were very high. In the COVID shock that we see now, uh, in the beginning of the shock, uh, uh, the spreads were going up. So even if the uh, risk-free rate was you know, uh, stable or even at some point going down because central banks action, the spreads were going down, up, up. And that, you know, in the and And this is a big difference between what we had in the previous crisis is that the ECB uh, started to intervene in national debt market. We will continue to discuss that because this is a key for the future. How long can the ECB do that? Uh, and uh, because the ECB de facto absorbed, absorbed uh, via its quantitative easing policy about the equivalent of the COVID you know, increase of the debt. So the increase of public debt has been broadly uh, absorbed by a central bank. So we will discuss that uh, as, as a main theme in our discussion, how long can it last, etc. So I, I repeat the argument and the interest rates are low for structural reasons, for monetary policy reasons, uh, but also uh, because of the risk premium which has fallen and have fallen and the risk premium has fallen, uh, I would say, to a large extent, but not only, to a large extent because of the policy of the ECB is intervening in national debt markets, 
but also, and this is an, an, an additional argument, because, because of the recovery and resilience funds, which basically gave a signal uh, that uh, the community, the uh, European Union, not only the euro area, but the European Union, would be uh, ready to support the countries uh, more than others, the countries that would be hit by this asymmetric shock, you know, uh, to the extent that the shock is asymmetric, uh, then uh, some uh, European money could be mobilized, a new money could be mobilized to support these countries. So, and that gave a very strong signal of cohesion and uh, solidarity within the Union, and then the spread started to go down very quickly. You see two phases. There was the ECB announcement, and there was the uh, recovery and resolution fund. So the two effects combined had a po very powerful uh, stabilizing effect on uh, the dynamic of public debt by the compression of the spread and countering speculation, which started really uh, when the COVID shock came. That was extremely powerful. The question is, of course, for the future. Peter, mag ik misschien even oh, tussen komen? Want een aantal mensen geven in de chat aan dat de, de verbinding toch niet zo goed is, dat de klankkwaliteit toch niet zo goed is. Ik weet niet. Heb jij earphones of, of is er nog mogelijkheid? Het zal niks veranderen. Dat is het probleem. Zijn misschien te veel mensen online? Ja, dat is een niveau. Ja, maar hoe hoe? Ik zal het Ja, nee, ik hoop je. Het zal niks. Het niks veranderen. Dat is wat ik vrees. Quelle est la qualité? Is que c'est? Ah, c'est beaucoup mieux. C'est beaucoup mieux. Ja, het is veel beter. Veel beter. Okay, okay. So let's continue. Uh, how how long was the interruption? How long was the interruption, Chris? Uh, yeah, that's toch a minute of six, seven geleden dat de eerste bericht is in binnenkomen. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, bon, c'est comme ça. Uh, on n'est pas encore dans le 5G. Mais uh, donc, ce que je disais, uh, what I was saying is about the spreads. So this is a big difference between uh, what happened in the previous crisis, is that. Uh, there are two factors. One is the ECB change in policy, because the ECB with the COVID shock said we will uh, ensure that uh, monetary policy is transmitted to all jurisdictions. This accommodative policy is transmitted to all jurisdictions. And so that had a very powerful signal on the markets that the ECB would intervene if needed in national debt market. This is a sort of revolution. We never, we never did that in my time. And the second, and, and that had a powerful uh, effect on the spreads and just on the debt dynamic and on confidence, actually. And, uh, but the second, and this is also very important, the second um, impact on, the, on, 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 on interest rates uh, was the recovery and resilience funds, fund, which was basically a, signal, a political signal of the union to say that, yes, we care, we care about asymmetric shock and so we are ready to mobilize European money and redistribute that to the country which are, have been hit most by the shock. And uh, more than the money, I think, which was used, I mean, money is important, but more than the money, uh, the money supported the credibility uh, of the signal by saying it's not only words, but it's deeds. You know, you put hard, money on the table and you distribute that money according to the severeness of the shock. Uh, this, uh, to, just to deal with an asymmetric. Of course, this is related to the pandemic period, so the COVID shock, uh, and we will discuss, you know, what could be the future there. Uh, but uh, it had a, a demonstration of a very powerful uh, impact. Now, when you compare with the 2010-2012 shock, there are many big differences. For that shock, uh, first, uh, you know, at that time, we had huge imbalances across countries. I think it's important not to forget that important point. There were huge imbalances when the shock came. So there was a feeling, uh, certainly among uh, countries like Germany, for example, uh, that the adjustment process, uh, when the crisis came, the burden of the adjustment process had to be bared by the deficit countries. And this was in line, you know, with, you know, the experience you mentioned, I worked for the IMF, but there was a little bit the, the, the idea that, you know, it's, it's better in a way to be in surplus as a country than in deficit. 
And when you, uh, you come here, it's capital markets, put, put your bond market. And uh, so the adjustment burden is uh, the responsibility of deficit countries, not the surplus countries. Uh, and in the 2010-2012 uh, crisis, that principle was applied. So you went into austerity, uh, which in a way, uh, the consequence was that the fiscal stance at that time was very restrictive in, in these years, because, you know, the deficit countries uh, had to, you know, squeeze, they had to have contractual policy, which I think was unfortunately needed. But the, 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 the other part of the coin, the other side of the coin, that means that surplus countries had also to make some adjustment, that means a sort of supportive uh, public finance to compensate, at least to some extent, the restrictive character of the contraction in deficit countries, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. And there was, of course, no European you know, stability mechanism uh, to support the business cycle at that time. That was absolutely out of the question. And so we had a very strong period of fiscal construction, contraction in 11, in 10, 12, and even 13, a while. Uh, and, and that led with, with a recession, of course, as you know, that was the second recession after the global financial crisis, that was the first one. And that, led, that put a very big pressure on the central bank to try to do all the job. Uh, ECB became the only game in, time, uh, in town, had to do the job of stabilization policy in crisis time. The problem you had at this time was that the interest rates were already very low. And, and so the ECB uh, at some point hit the lower bound. So the interest rates went to zero. And so what do you do? The ECB says, I need to stabilize the economy because, you know, you're in a recession. Uh, there is uh, inflation is too low compared to my mandate. My mandate. Uh, I have to stimulate the economy, but the interest rates are low. And that's how the ECB came. That was my time with negative rates, with forward guidance. That means promises on future rates and with quantitative easing. That means buying directly in the market, this quantitative easing asset purchases. And, uh, and we are still in this period now. The big difference, as I said before, is that at that time, when the ECB was buying uh, mostly government bonds on the market, the ECB basically uh, bought according to uh, the weight of countries, what we call the capital keys, doesn't matter, but the weight of countries, not the weight of public debt, but it was just saying, I want to buy proportion, pro uh, I want to buy in proportion to what we call the capital key, so the, the importance of uh, the shareholdership in the ESCB uh, in the central bank, you know, by countries, more or less. But that would not be uh, according to the market proportion of the debt. So Italian debt, as you know, is much higher than in Germany, but you would buy according to the capital key, uh, so much less than the market, which, okay, that's, 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 that's related to basically to the treaty, uh, which where there's a high suspicion, I mean, first there is a, the treaty forbids, you know, to support countries, specific countries, uh, public debt. So that's forbidden in the treaty. Uh, so there is, cannot be privileged fin finance. There is also in the treaty a big trust, you know, faith in, in market mechanism in general. So in market discipline in, in general, and there is no this not this notion, you know, uh, about destabilizing speculation or adverse feedback loop, you know, for markets. <laughs> there is a lot of trust in market mechanism in general to discipline uh, countries in general in public finances. Uh, I cannot, sorry, I cannot elaborate very much on that. But basically, uh, the ECB uh, cannot really uh, intervene uh, in, in markets. Cannot intervene in markets and. Uh, so that's, uh, that was the situation there. But as I say, there was no uh, uh, sort of discussion about the po what we call today the policy stance. If countries are, you know, uh, squeezing very much, and I think there was, this adjustment was needed at that time, but it was not compensated by uh, in the surplus countries, and even lesser, by a sort of European mechanism of stabilization policy. Uh, 
Now, when you go in the present situation, in the present situation, when the COVID shock came, and this is for me a revolution compared to the period when I was there, is that suddenly all the countries uh, realized that, uh, and also drawing the lessons from the previous crisis, that if they wouldn't intervene very quickly, uh, you could enter a, a, a period of total destabilization of the public debt of some countries like Italy, uh, and that would destroy that would destroy the eurozone. That would be the end of the eurozone. And there is a spectacular uh, change, you know, in communication and in policy between your members. Some of you may remember when Christine Lagarde said, "We are not here to close the spread." In in the beginning of the COVID shock, when the spread were increasing already. She said, that's not our business, which is true. Uh, that's, that's the policy. It's not, uh, and that's the most related to the treaty, actually. You cannot uh, take that into account. This is the time of Mario Draghi. We have invented the OMT, which was a special instrument, a conditional instrument, but with a whole procedure uh, that a country would ask for that first, uh, the OMT, to have a, you know, to ask that you would have to go with a program uh, managed basically by the political body, uh, with the commission as the main, you know, technical arm. Uh, and uh, on that condition, uh, the ECB uh, may, may not even oblige, intervene uh, in the bond market to support the country. If the ECB would have been satisfied about the program, you know, the sustainability of public debt, which is a long procedure, which is absolutely horrific from a political point of view, of course. So that was the instrument. So when Christine Lagarde said, we are not here to close the pay, actually, she was right in the framework. But very quickly, everybody realized, I think everybody, including, uh, you see, the, the, the hardliners in, in the governing council, it was some, maybe a little bit more difficult to accept. But at some point, you know, everybody, political bodies, you know, governors realized that if you would not do something, uh, then uh, it would it could be the end again of the, of the euro this time. That was the fatal the fatal blow. And very quickly, then the ECB came with its PEP, you know, its pandemic emergency purchase program. What, what helped is first that it was an exogenous shock. You have this, you know, huge imbalances uh, that you had, you know, in the 2010, 13, you know, big shock, 10, 12, you know, big shock. Uh, you didn't have that, so it's exogenous. So it's not the responsibility of Italy uh, that you have a COVID. Everybody has a bit responsibility because you, you are responsible of your health system, but still it's basically an exogenous shock. Then everybody agree this is a different situation. Be careful because for the future, uh, nothing is, 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 is granted. This is still you know, exceptional what is being done here. And this is the discussion for the future. When the pandemic crisis is over, are you going to back to the old model uh, in a situation where public debt are much higher than before or not? So you are still in, in, in a, so a problem which is not solved. Uh, so in the pandemic, I think re reaction was good, but it's an exogenous shock. And that policy is limited to the pandemic shock. So yes, the ECB start to intervene. And then, as I said, the, the, the second wave of reaction, which was absolutely key, was the Recovery and Resolution Fund, which gave a fantastic, I think, political signal of solidarity and also take into account, you know, the asymmetry of the shock. So you give more to Italy than you give to Germany, for example. And uh, European taxpayers later on, we don't know exactly how, will pay much later. And the European Union is using its borrowing capacity, uh, its, its good safe asset sort of name, uh, to borrow cheaply on a capital market. And it's extremely successful for the time being. The question, and there is, I should add, in the money which is spent via grants and, 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 and cheap loans, there is a mechanism of uh, approval of, of the project, as you know, I'm not going to describe all that. And there is a mechanism of surveillance where you don't give this money in immediately. So it's given different phases, you know, according to uh, so the realization uh, of uh, the uh, different project which has been introduced to the, to the commission, actually. And uh, so I think this is a, a, a very good mechanism, but it's, 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 it's related to an exogenous crisis, and uh, it's probably going to end. Normally, it should 
end at some point. So that's that's for the recovery and resolution part. Where do we go in the future? And to, to leave time for a lot of time for the questions, where does it leave for the future? Let's take the ECB and the QE uh, and the quantitative easing uh, policy. I think on the, the side of first explaining what is QE. When interest rates are at zero or we experimented with negative rates, how can you have monetary accommodation. So basically what you do, you make promises on future rates because you, you control the money market rates, the short end of uh, interest rates. And you can say, I will keep the interest rates because that's my power, very low for a long period of time. And then you specify, you know, what are the conditions. It's related to inflation, which is the primary mandate of the ECB. And so you say, well, the inflation is going to be low, uh, inflation remains too low, and I'm going to, re to keep the interest rate at the present level, even lower maybe, uh, until I see uh, 2%, my objective realized. It's a bit more complicated, but basically it's what the ECB is saying. So it's making promises. Now, everybody says, well, inflation is going to be low in the long term. I'm not talking about the short-term shock because it's a medium-term uh, objective. So... Inflation is, inflation is going to go back to 2% on a sustained basis. As long as this is not the case, I will keep my interest rate low and my monetary policy accommodate. Uh, but the situation could change. Uh, and as I say, I think it's a relatively low risk probability, but it's not a zero probability that you get more inflation in the coming three, four years. I, I mean, sustained inflation. Uh, <laughs> And that uh, the interest rate policy would have to change by the ECB. That's absolutely not uh, something that is impossible. Uh, so you could say there is an 80% probability that interest rates will remain low for a very long period of time. But when you manage a situation of public finances and uh, you uh, are highly indebted, uh, then you have to take that into consideration. And that's one factor of risk. If you have 60% that GDP ratio, it's not the same as if you have 165% of GDP ratio. Now, people will say, yes, but, you know, uh, the um, uh, governments like, you know, the Treasury in Belgium or the Treasury in Italy or France have issued long-term debt. Uh, but think about the situation. Uh, the ECB would buy on the markets, uh, but the equivalent, more or less the equivalent of what has been issued. And in exchange, the ECB issued money, currency, uh, that means short-term, short-term debt. Okay? So you could imagine that when a country says, oh, no worry, if interest rate will increase, I'm protected because I issued my debt at 10-year maturity. So at fixed rate, 10-year maturity. But if you take the consolidated position, the state plus the central bank, actually, uh, and some people say that, uh, it's a simple operation of conversion of long-term debt, which is bought by the central bank, which issues short-term debt currency. And so the exposure to interest rate, the indirect exposure by the central bank of the state is higher. In some countries like the UK, the exposure is quite high. Uh, and uh, and so, yes, they issue long-term debt, but to the extent that it's converted via the central bank into short-term debt, there is a risk uh, because it's not as long as you think. Uh, if, the, if the central bank has to increase interest rates, its profit and loss account, the profitability of the central bank is going to go down. That means that profit, which is distributed most often, uh, that is a bit different, but it's distributed to the state in the public finances will be lesser. Uh, so the public finances will, will have to bear the burden of lesser, what we call seniorage, from the central bank to the government. Uh, if you look at the Bundesbank in Germany for this year, the Bundesbank, uh, I think, used to give last year about, five, if I remember, 5 billion euros to the treasury in Germany as profit from its activities. Uh, this year, they decided to give nothing to the, to the Treasury because they want to provision against, what I tell you now, the risk related to the policies of the Bundesbank. I know that market participants 
are looking at this increasingly to say how are the central bank resilient if one day they have to increase rates, uh, what is their profitability and what would be the impact on the budget via the transfer of profits to the, to the government. I think that, I mean, I am not panicking here. I think it's, it's a shock that can be absorbed. It depends on the increase of rates at that time. Uh, so I'm not panicking, but I think we have to look at in the risk considerations. So I, I would not say dramatize that issue, but I think this adds to the risk. So now let's think again about uh, the intervention of the ECB in national debt markets. So the ECB, uh, in the COVID shock, we have seen a big increase of spreads in some countries. And the ECB has decided that its QE, its quantitative easing policy, uh, would uh, also be geared towards uh, supporting accommodative policies in all jurisdictions. I, I try to find, we want to ensure, I try to quote exactly, we want to ensure that our accommodative monetary policy is transmitted to all jurisdictions. This is new in the, in the treaty, you know, you never thought about this because in the treaty, you, you basically is one size of policy must fit all. So you determine interest rates and uh, if interest rates are too low for Germany, they have to deal with that, they have to live with that. If interest rates are too high for another countries, well, there's nothing you can do. Uh, and uh, what you could not you can do in monetary policy, what you can do is of course use your fiscal capacity, your national fiscal capacity. Uh, for example, if you think interest rates are too, too low in Germany, well, what can you do to try to compensate that? If you think, for example, that in Germany, the fact that interest rates are too low uh, and your, your, your economy overheats, you know, there is an overheating problem in Germany, well, they could use public finances if they want. The, 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 the idea of the treaty was that. And if you look at another country when inter interest rates are too high, you have to try to use fiscal policy to support the economy because interest rates are too high for the country, so use fiscal. And so the treaty uh, was that you need sound public finances because if there are shocks, you know, if you cannot work, live with the single monetary policy, you have to use your fiscal for national purposes, for national purposes, as an anti-cyclical, you know, counter-cyclical policy instrument. And as we know, the countries didn't use the buffers, didn't create buffers in the good times. Uh, and when the crisis came, they didn't have the means to do that. And that, then it, 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 the, the policies, fiscal policies became pro-cyclical. I mean, as I... Level. What is the? Do we need a stabilization policy at the European Union level? And the basic thing that ECB has to look at that at by monetary policy. Uh, the treaty didn't think about the situation where your interest rates would be zero and there would be increasing constraint on the central bank. And so the debate now is open to say, uh, do we need? And I go in my, the last phase, which will lead to a discussion, what we have learned from the 13 last years, these episodes, uh, do you need to rethink the stabilization policy in the monetary union? Do you need a stabilization <laughs> policy uh, which uh, is not relying only on the central bank uh, for two reasons? Because first, when the central bank is at the zero lower bound, you know, it needs some fiscal support because, you know, it, it, it gets increasingly limited in its stabilization purposes. So you need fiscal when the central bank is a lower bound. But even more than that, even if the interest rates will normalize, uh, you could also think that the ECB as a whole would need a stabilization policy for the euro area as a whole. But in addition to that, in addition to that, uh, would that stabilization policy also uh, consider the situation of different countries, of different countries, which would be a revolution? We are very far from that. And the direction in which we are today, uh, for the, for, let me say, for the ECB, 
uh, is uh, very uncertain. Markets are, you know, writing a lot about when the pandemic instrument uh, is finished. Is the ECB going to return to the old policy that we are not here to close the spreads? So that's the responsibility of countries, of politicians, but not the ECB. And uh, if there is a problem in a country because of speculation, because of bad policy or whatever, uh, then the country has to go via the uh, OMT procedure, which is basically uh, going to Europe and asking for a program. And on that condition, you know, the ECB would intervene in the market. So you take the OMT procedure. So that's one way. So you go back to the old or you try to, uh, you know, develop mechanism under which, you know, uh, the ECB could still intervene in markets. Now, the ECB has one point, and uh, this is really very speculative, but the ECB in its strategy review writes that uh, financial stability, uh, writes that financial stability uh, is, uh, someone is trying to reach me, I, I would just say no, uh, that financial stability is a, a consideration in monetary policy, and uh, that uh, if you read the strategy the money the policy within within the that and I know that this is very controversial intervene. Ah, J'ai perdu Peter, moi. Ja. Is... Ah. Peter, je bent even ja. weggevallen. We horen u niet meer. Ah. Peter, on t'a perdu depuis 2-3 minutes. Nee, we horen nu niet meer, Peter. The question when the pandemic crisis is, the question is, will the ECB, uh, if there is a, a shock in a country, uh, will the ECB, uh, in some circumstances, continue the policy it's doing today? Do you hear me? Yeah, oui, ben you make, mais on t'a perdu questions? depuis quelques minutes, Peter. Oui, mais c'est revenu ou pas Maintenant, oui. Ça revient. Donc, la, la question pour l'avenir, c'est euh, est-ce que quand la crise, uh, when the pandemic crisis is over, uh, are, you going, are you going back to what Christine Lagarde said, we are not here to close the spread, and you go back to an ONT mechanism if the country is in trouble it has to go via, you know, the old procedure with conditionality and the uh, OMT of the central bank. Uh, or uh, is it different? This is very, very controversial. In the strategy review of the ECB, uh, there is no nothing on this. There is nothing on this. Uh, but there is a little, there is a, uh, there is a controversial, but a new dimension, which is financial stability, where the ECB says we are going to look at the transmission of monetary policy uh, if there are financial instability issues. And under that provision, you, you may at some point decide in the government that they are destabilizing you know, market factors that may justify interventions of these uh, in specific debt markets. But this is extremely controversial still today. Uh, Philip Lane mentioned, but for the COVID shock, only for the, the, the ECB would counter non-fundamental volatility of shock and ensure the proper transmission of monetary policy in all jurisdictions. So that was in the COVID period. In the post-COVID period, uh, will the ECB, you know, have 
term policy regarding market instability, uh, which would include specific intervention in the market. Uh, this is very uh, controversial today. So uh, when we put that in public at the national level, it is a significant risk factor. So you, 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 you have to build in, in your debt sustainability analysis. And for because moral hazard is contained, you know, because if you say, well, we don't care, you know, about our public finances because the point to frame in a sort of policy framework which uh, guarantees debt sustainability. And for that, you need... You Peter, misschien eens proberen om de camera uit te schakelen? Uh, Dat is toch moeilijk begrijpbaar. Oké. Okay. Ja. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, let's... Uh, I'm not sure it goes better, but uh, maybe it goes better. Yeah. Uh, I will not... Benoît, je te vois, donc toi, tu me fais les signes si ça okay. marche. Maintenant, ça, ça fonctionne bien. Peut-être yeah. reprends ces quelques Donc, dernières minutes, Peter, parce qu'il y a beaucoup de gens qui n'ont pas entendu et c'était coupé. Sa dernière euh, démonstration sur so, euh, la pré-Covid uh, et la politique repeat. monétaire. Oui. Yes. Yeah. Is it possible yeah. to repeat? During the, du, during the COVID period, but it, I say it is during the COVID period, the central bank, uh, I quote Philippe Lane, said, we will counter non-fundamental volatility of spreads. He also, as other members of the governing council said, we will ensure uh, that uh, the accommodative monetary is transmitted to all jurisdictions. Okay? To all jurisdictions is transmitted. So will that continue? Or will there be something in the post-COVID period, or do we go back to the old framework? Uh, we are not here to close the spread. And if, you know, there is a problem in a country, it has to go via a program and the ECB under the OMT will intervene. So that's, if you go back to that uh, situation, that's one scenario, you go back, and you can have a transition, of course, but you go back to that. I think it's a possibility And I think that's part of the risk factor of the countries which are more indebted. So you, you, you cannot just count that the policy of the ECB uh, will continue. Second, uh, it is also possible uh, because uh, that the ECB uh, has more attention to market destabilizing factors. If you look at the strategy review of the ECB, it is written that... Uh, For financial stability reasons, the ECB will look at this transmission mechanism. So that's in the future. And in the transmission mechanism, it may be, you know, fragmented. It may be disrupted by speculation, you know, by excessive market movements. And so the ECB uh, opens the door, I think, to interventions to guarantee proper transmission uh, of monetary policy. But, but you still have to define that. It's very controversial. What would be the conditions under which the central bank uh, in the future, when the COVID crisis is over, will or would or could intervene in national debt markets? It is clear that it would only do that if there is a convincing market destabilization process. Second, uh, the ECB would certainly look at the fundamentals, that means also debt sustainability, uh, and they would have necessarily, uh, you know, be a link at some point, which is very difficult to design with a political body, uh, because, but the ECB as an independent authority would always in the end decide what to do, uh, but before you decide, you want to ensure that if you intervene because you think they're speculative destabilizing movements uh, in a specific debt markets, if you decide to intervene, which, as I say, it's very controversial also legally, uh, you want to be sure and sure that debt sustainability would be guaranteed, which may need a, you may need a program in a country, 
Uh, and for that, there's a, there is a link, of course, uh, with the political body, that means the Eurogroup and the Commission. Uh, that remains to be done. Now, when you talk about public finances in a country like Belgium in the coming years, these are risk factors that you have to take into account. Uh, what the ECB does today does not necessarily mean that it does it later on, uh, because that framework is not specified. I think that's a key issue when you manage your public finance in terms of risk also, is that even if you borrow long term, don't forget uh, part of the long term is transformed into short term via the central bank. That was an argument I had before. So you are a little bit uh, more exposed to interest rate via the PL of the central bank. The second I say is that the policy of intervening in national debt market, uh, there's a backstop. Uh, is specific to the pandemic crisis. The framework post-pandemic is not yet there, uh, and it's controversial. I think there is an opening by the central bank when the central bank says, we are also looking uh, in terms of financial stability for uh, the proper transmission of monetary policy. The transmission can be destabilized by speculation, but speculation may also be related to uh, debt uh, a debt dynamic which is unsustainable. So you see, and that's extremely controversial. And I, uh, that has still to be put in place. So when you put your public finances today, and la trajectoire of your public finance today, you have to take into account these factors. You cannot just say, well, the ECB will intervene. Uh, the ECB will always keep uh, uh, first, they may say no, and in any case, they will keep, you know, ambiguity uh, on, on interventions. And the framework that we have today, uh, post-COVID, uh, is still the OMT framework with conditionality and uh, where many countries do not want to go through that. Now, the, the last point uh, to, to keep time for the discussion, the last point is uh, that the... Uh, and that's beyond, you know, national debt market is do we also need, uh, especially when the central bank is at the lower bound, do we also need in interest rate, and just a zero rate, do we also need a fiscal stabilization policy at the euro area level? Uh, so where there is a borrowing capacity, what we call a fiscal capacity uh, from the European, the European Union uh, to borrow money in bad time and uh, have you know, supporting aggregate demand in bad time, in recessions, at the euro area level, uh, where you could also support some countries more than others, and in good times it go the other way. We are very far away from that. Uh, the, the, I, think, I think it's needed. I think a monetary union would need a federal budget uh, much bigger than what we have today, even if you include the recovery and resolution fund. But I think the recovery, recovery and resolution fund is an excellent example. It's really a big change, but it's COVID-related. But if the money is spent wisely, correctly, uh, I think uh, it, 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 I think it opens the door to a much better uh, monetary union than what institutionally, I mean, than what we had in before. If the, mo the money is not well used, it would be a catastrophe. It would go the other way. And so the commission has a big responsibility because the surveillance of how the money is being used is in the hands, primary hands, you know, of the commission. And uh, I think the countries are serious in this. So for the time being, you know, it looks good. But I mean, it's, it's a long period of experimentation. And we have some years uh, here to see how it goes, how it's implemented in the recovery phase. So I'm quite optimistic here. But as I say, uh, in terms of risk management, risk management, when you take it in, in, at the country level, I think what, we should not be naive to say, you know, well, public debt is high, uh, but interest rates are low uh, because, you know, of aging, demography, et cetera, et cetera, and will remain low. Uh, second, the spreads, you know, the risk premium on, on, on national debt will remain low because the ECB will intervene. And because maybe, you know, Europe will be mobilized, you know, if uh, there are destabilizing speculation at some point in time in the future. So I think uh, in terms of risk management, I mean, my only message, which is very simple, 
is to be cautious. I think the debt levels that we have in a number of countries, of which Belgium, uh, are quite high. Uh, I think they are sustainable, of course, but it's not without risk. And I think the risk uh, component is key. So it's a risk management issue. It's clear also that the, 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 the quality of public finances will be of key importance, the quality of public finance, how do you spend the money. And at the end of the day, what you need uh, to make that sustainable is that you have sufficiently growth in the economy. So that means that the money has to be used in general to support potential growth of the economy so that you get tax revenues that allows you to support you know, uh, your, your, your fiscal, uh, your, your, your public debt in the future. And so I, I think here, when I see the debt dynamic in a country like Belgium, but I basically look at the uh, Bureau du Plan, the planning uh, office, Plan Bureau, uh, uh, when I look at this, I say, yes, debt is not fully stabilized uh, by 2020. It continues to increase while the interest payments, you know, stay broadly stable at 1.4%. I think this is a debt dynamic which is uh, a little bit uh, worrisome. I would not say it's dramatically bad, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's worrisome. It gives, doesn't give you sufficiently safety. But you have to, to manage, I think, for the policymakers, which is very difficult to do. You have to be very selective, of course, in your project. You have to be sure that your potential growth is supported. Uh, and uh, <laughs> maybe you pray, you pray so that it works. But it's, uh, it's, it, it's a fragile situation, frankly. And uh, when I see that even if it increases a little bit over time, so it's not stabilized, I think it's, it's good. I would not uh, argue uh, that you need uh, austerity, you know, a, a very st a strong uh, fiscal contraction. I would absolutely not argue that. But I think it will be extremely delicate because there are many new demands, you know, in healthcare, in security, in climate change, uh, and also, you know, uh, fight against poverty, etc. And so the, the, the fiscal position will be extremely delicate to manage politically uh, in the future. And so, uh, yes, it's not a comfortable situation. The public in general, and I really conclude with that, the public in general uh, has, uh, I would say, uh, that a bit of fiscal illusion. You know, our rates are low. You can borrow cheaply, you know, at zero rate. Uh, money anyway will be well used, you know, whatever you do, you know, it's good because it supports, you know, uh, you know solidarity or whatever, digitalization, climate, etc. And uh, I think uh, in a way it's good that people are not too worried today because we are still in the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, we are not yet out. But on the other hand, what I fear is, you know, when the hard realities will come back, you know, in 23 maybe or later in 22 in the discussion on the budget, suddenly you know, people start to realize that actually, you know, the honeymoon period that we had, you know, where nobody cares about fiscal, comes back with revenge, you know, at some point, and uh, that I wouldn't like. So let's be reasonable, and uh, and I think, you know, manage the public uh, finance at best. When you look at climate, it will cost, you know, in public investment 0.5 to 1% per year, you know, in this decade, uh, additional per year. Uh, which is huge uh, if we are serious about climate, uh, and uh, you cannot finance that, you know, uh, you know, in addition to what we did here. I think I don't think so, and so uh, I think the situation remains fragile. But I think it's sustainable with some wisdom. Yes, Benoit, and sorry for that. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, I, I tried to, to say, summarize you. a lot of questions. There is a lot of question about the, the level of sustainability of Belgian uh, debt. And there is a study of uh, the Belgian uh, Central Bank about a level of 120 percentage of GDP. What do you think about that? There is a, a risk of sustainability uh, for Belgium with, uh, with the debt? I. Uh, uh, uh... I think, uh, I think the, you see, I think the, the Italian debt, to take a worse example, the Italian debt is sustainable. Uh, 160 or something like this percent of GDP is sustainable, but, 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 but uh, it's sustainable under some conditions that, that you don't have a, you know, a, a big recession, that interest rates will remain relatively low. And uh, there are a lot of debt sustainability analysis uh, about countries. 
And yes, it's true that even a country like Italy with 160% of GDP, the debt is sustainable, uh, but there are risks, you know. So the, you, you go in, into what we call, you know, orange or red zone, you know, and uh, if you combine, for example, which is not impossible, uh, I did many, when I was in the ECB, the staff, of course, I did many simulations about the sustainability of different countries. Uh, and uh, Belgium, that is certainly sustainable, but it's not, you know, in all scenarios, in all scenarios, and uh, in some credible scenarios, not impossible scenario, you get into very big difficulties. Uh, so, for example, in a country like Italy, uh, what we calculated is when you are in a recession and when uh, interest rates go up, then it's the end of it. It's, it's finished. You're finished. Uh, and that can happen. And that was happening with the COVID because we had a huge recession. The spreads were going up because once markets said, you know, the, the risk is increasing, people are selling the debt, interest rates go up, and you are in a recession. And that's why, because we were very close to a catastrophe, a real catastrophe, uh, the ECB and uh, all the political bodies, including in Germany, decided to go the way we have seen, which was very, very good. I think that was wise. And thanks to the experience of 2010 and 12, but we should not be naive and think that what happened in the COVID, uh, you know, will happen in any circumstance. If you have, a, for example, a severe political crisis uh, in, in, in one country, I'm not talking Belgium here, take a country with high public debt, and that political crisis uh, has to do with public finances, that uh, different, you know, there's no agreement about, not about the composition of, but about to limit the deficit at some point. Uh, and uh, markets can be very, very aggressive at some point. Uh, and uh, so for exogenous shock, you can be assured, you know, if there is a cyber attack, you know, that, that puts a big shock, you know, on banks and then on the economy uh, in the coming years, I think the mechanism we discussed today can be uh, put in place again. Uh, if there is a, think about a, a climate, a big shock at one point in time, you know, there is a big climate catastrophe, yes. But if one country uh, doesn't manage well its public finances because lack of political consensus, and you start from a high level of debt, uh, in, uh, then, I mean, it's not guaranteed. So you have to preempt all these things before. I think under 20% is sustainable, but not sustainable in all conditions. But in, in most conditions, yes, under 20% is sustainable. But I would, my point is the quality of public finance. What do you do with the money? And you have to be sure that the money leads to, you know, growth at some point in the economy because you need taxes you know, revenues at some point to support all, you know, the spending we need to do in the future, including the aging, the pensions and all that. So the quality is the key. And if you have 120% GDP debt ratio with very high quality, you know, sort of, uh, for example, you invest, you invest in education and you say, okay, for that I need, I need more debt. I would say, fine, the idea is a good one, but I want to see results because as we know, it's not because you spent more in one item, could it be education or climate or whatever, that it leads indeed to a higher quality of uh, education or more skilled people coming on the labor market later on. It's, there is no, uh, so you have to be very granular. It's not enough to, to say, I will, you know, increase spending in healthcare. You also want to look at the, the efficiency of the spending you do. So there must be a control on that. It's not just to to fill, you know, some boxes by saying, you know, education, absolutely, education is good, but it's the quality and the outcome that you have, which in the end, unfortunately, <laughs> it's very materialist, but it has to lead to, to a skilled, you know, labor forest, you know, at the end of the day. And that applies to all the items. And, and I realize politically it, it, it's, it's quite difficult, but that's what, you know, makes that sustainable. It's, it's the ability of a country to, to, to agree uh, on public taxes and revenues and a deficit uh, that uh, where you say, if I have a deficit, uh, that money is well used and will lead to higher growth later on that will enable me to service the debt. 
I think the countries that bet, you know, that rates will remain low for a long time and they gamble, you know, that if something happens, you know, Europe will be there or the central bank will do what is needed. I think that that is naive and dangerous. Thank you. There are also a lot of questions about investment. Huh? Uh, the question in investment in uh, public expenditure is very important. What do you think about the possibility to exclude uh, from uh, European rules, uh, fiscal rules, um, the amount of uh, investment? And uh, it is possible to define uh, very clearly uh, investment concept. Yes. No, that's the, I mentioned education, but you are quite right. You you, you can mention climate related uh, investment, uh, for example, or, or digitalization, which um, the there is a, a Bruegel paper uh, that deals uh, that 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 is being presented at I think the Eurogroup today actually in Ljubljana, uh, and I advise uh, those who haven't seen it to read it. Uh, and they propose here to have some off budget, you see, uh, sort of, uh, that it would not be under the, the um, stability and growth pact rules to say there is a, a special, you know, climate crisis and you want to prevent, you know, a bigger shock later on. So you, the, the, the efforts are so huge that you need, you know, to, to spend more and that would be in a special budget. I, I understand the argument, uh, and uh, I must also say that uh, in Germany, as you know, there are elections in Germany coming soon, in about a bit more than a week, and uh, that uh, some parties also think about, you know, off-budget, you know, spending. For me, it doesn't make a big, a big difference to be off-budget, uh, because it will be the, the public debt anyway. Uh, the difference, perhaps, is that it's, it, 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 it is something you can monitor specifically. Uh, but when you talk about climate and investment in climate, it's so huge, you know, in terms of, you know, the range of measures that you could take uh, that I, I unfortunately I remain a little bit skeptical. And I, I, I personally am quite worried about this uh, issue about climate because it's a necessity uh, and we are very late uh, and you need huge amount to mobilize huge amount of, of money. Uh, but also uh, big changes in taxes and regulation. So it's not only the question of money, uh, but also if you want to make changes in behavior, you need to change taxes, of course, and regulation, and also mobilize mob money, private and public money, which I think it's a huge task. Uh, it's a huge task, very difficult to do. And that's, that, that comes for me, we don't know the impact uh, of climate policy on the potential growth in the coming years. Uh, it, I personally, I see it like Jean Pisani, uh, Pisani Ferry also advised you to read, you know, a very good piece uh, on that. I, I broadly agree with all what he writes. Uh, is I think there is a, probably a, a negative supply shock uh, because if you have a machine, you know, you think it will be there for the next 10 years. And then suddenly you say it's obsolete. I have to change it with new capital. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a what we call a negative supply shock. So it, it pushes the firm uh, in, you know, to a stress because you know the amortization is faster than what you thought. So governments may give subsidies, and uh, or not. Uh, it will affect your PNL, of course. And uh, and uh, and uh, does it lead to higher productivity uh, in the country? I mean, in the next three, four years, it may be good for climate, but it's not necessarily uh, needs to higher GDP growth that will give you tax revenues, you know, to finance all this. So it's it's so yes, I know digitalization may go the other way, but there are so many uncertainties uh, that again I go back to my principle of prudence uh, that uh, you have to be very selective in what you do with your money. Uh, I yes, probably you will have to do something in climate which is very well identified, but uh, as uh, Benoit was rightly saying, what is an investment today, you know, uh, and uh, there are so many choices. Uh, that's not my expertise, but when I see huge money to subsidize electric cars, uh, I mean, I don't know. Frankly, I don't know. That's a huge subsidy. That's a big change. Change. Uh, I don't know if it's, uh, it's a good investment for the future. I have no idea that money could perhaps be much better used in other things, but I don't know, frankly.
And uh, so there may be plenty of these sort of questions in the coming years. What is for sure is that the uncertainty, uh, the regulatory tax uncertainties, and even fiscal, you know, budgetary uncertainties are likely to increase because of, you know, this huge change in policy, which is in the making and needed and needed. Uh, and again, I come back to, to, my, to my easy point, you know, easy is it's to be careful. Um, and what do you think it's, it's possible to imagine that in Europe it's possible to finance uh, a climate investment in the same way that the recovery plan with a robust yes. plan? Yes. Well, it's already uh, it's already the the case today, you know, uh, that the RRF is 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 not a crisis instrument. It's a little bit because we are still in crisis. But the main idea there is for the future. It's a recovery plan. So, yes, it's already being done. Uh, can we do more? I, I don't know if we can do more. Uh, so that's a, that's a question. I mean, I don't know if we can do more. I, I, I'm sorry, I have eight minutes, uh, Benoit. Yes. Uh, let's um, uh, Chris, est que, do you see other question, Chris? Uh... Oui, il y a une question assez euh, euh, un peu oui, radicale. On peut dire, euh, à un certain moment, euh, ne faudrait-il pas songer à annuler une partie des dettes détenues par la Banque centrale européenne euh, si cet argent est consacré, par exemple, à la transition énergétique pour un moment limité ou une période limitée C'est une question. Euh, micro, micro, Pedro. Micro, micro. No, I mean, I, the arguments have been, have, been, uh, have been explained before. I mean, I think the, the question, uh, uh, no, it's because we don't have much time. Uh, and, and this has been debated very much in France. And there have been so many papers explaining why this is an illusion. Again, unfortunately, if that would be possible. Uh, I think the one, one way of seeing that is that the ECB Uh, in its portfolio uh, of government debt that it has bought, could uh, reinvest reinvest uh, this portfolio for a very 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 long period of time. So you you just keep it keep it on the balance sheet of the ECB. Uh, the the problem they could do that. The ECB could do that. Uh, the the problem is at some point you see if the ECB has to increase the rates at some point. Uh, the impact on the economy will be there uh, because, as I said before, the long-term debt is actually converted in money, uh, in short-term debt. So if you say the long-term debt that you bought is even longer, long, 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 longer, the other part of the balance sheet of a central bank is short-term debt. So the day you have to increase the rates will have full impact, even if you reinvest for long-term. I don't say that In market dynamics, it can make a difference, of course. Uh, so, but structurally, it doesn't change, and uh, it doesn't change anything. Chris, do you want another question? Debt is, the debt, in other words, the, the public debt is in the balance sheet of the central bank on both sides. It's it's on the asset side in long-term debt, and you can lengthen that. But it's on the liability side with the money that you issued in the market. And the day you have to increase the rates, you will have to increase the rates on short term money, if I can say. So the, the volume will be there. Is, the volume is still there. And if you have to withdraw the volume uh, because you want to tighten the policy, I mean, you will, have to, you will do that. I mean, it's, uh, so it would not make a difference to my view. It can make some difference if uh, via announcement effects, you know, that. Uh, for example, if the ECB would say, I stop my reinvestment tomorrow, uh, yes, it, it will have an impact on the markets, of course, on market dynamic. But structurally, uh, it would not, it not would me make a difference in, the, in terms of debt sustainability. Il y a une question très précise qui demande pourquoi est-ce que les banques centrales sont obligées de rémunérer les réserves des banques commerciales? Oui, alors on peut dire. <laughs> That's the other way. You could say you could say <clears throat> you can tax you can tax the liquidity of banks and ruin ruin the banks. So there there is perhaps something you can do a little bit 
uh, but uh, it will have an impact via the banking sector if you do that. Uh, yeah. They're not very profitable nowadays, so I'm, I'm not so sure. No, I think, I mean, I think I, I like these questions because I, I, I would love to say you're right, you see, and there is an easy way. Uh, but I think be careful, you know, frankly, <clears throat> don't, don't go into illusions that, you know, <clears throat> and as I say, if you use the money wisely, uh, and, and that's a big question, of course, uh, if you use the money wisely, uh, the 120% of GDP uh, is, is okay. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not a problem. Uh, but when I say wisely, uh, unfortunately, it's not an ethical concept, unfortunately. Uh, it is an economic financial concept also. Well, you need to do both, of course, but it means that you need at some point to have an impact, a positive impact on GDP, which would give you some revenues for the future. And uh, so uh, with the climate, a number of spending uh, will probably not increase the potential growth rate. It will me mean the, the environment better. And in the longer term, it, it's good for GDP even because you know, people are healthier. Uh, but for a number of years, it will not be necessary uh, revenues enhancing. It will not give you revenues. And uh, so I think the situation remains extremely delicate. So you have to be very parsimonious. And I can understand that you take some room of maneuver uh, because you have front, to front load some of the investment. I agree on that. Uh, that's why I say one has to be careful also not to fall in the austerity de debate. Uh, and you have to think carefully. But you see, if you want to make more investment, uh, you cannot just say you can do everything. More investment, uh, better pensions, better health care. Uh, cho hard choices will have to be made. But I, I don't exclude, of course, uh, cuts in, in, in some of the spending uh, and, and increase of taxes. That, that's possible. And as, as you know, with climate, you can increase CO2 taxes and redistribute that. Uh, that's a that, of course, will be done. It's very difficult mm -hmm. politically. I really have to stop, uh, friends, um, okay. dear participants. Sorry. Yeah. Merci Peter, en tout cas, euh, merci beaucoup pour euh, ce débat, euh, je sais que tu as une contrainte à, à, à 11h30, en tout cas, euh, ben, nous allons diffuser, euh, puisque tu nous y as autorisé euh, sur le site et euh, qui est dédié à ce débat sur les finances publiques, donc, je rappelle en même temps à tout le monde qu'à partir de maintenant, le site est ouvert, donc les gens peuvent faire euh, des propositions et euh, alimenter le débat, euh, et donc euh, ben, je sais que Peter, de toute façon, si on avait besoin de le réentendre, il nous dira oui, hein, euh, et que ce sera un plaisir, en tout cas, euh, de le rencontrer euh, à nouveau. En tout cas, je souhaite à tout le monde une excellente journée. Je remercie encore, évidemment, Peter, pour cette intervention. Et désolé pour les, 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 les noise, the noise. Il y a eu quelques interruptions. Uh, so, sorry for that. Uh, OK. OK. Bonne journée, merci à tout le monde. Merci. merci et bonne journée. Oui.